Good uh, afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on the topic pH measurement. What is important if you need the right pH value? My name is Jean Therium, and I am your host today. During the session, you will receive valuable information about the subject matter from a real expert in pH measurements and electrodes. The lecture will be given by Wolfgang Knappek. He is European Sales Director for Lab and Field Products at Xylem Analytics. It is a leading provider of premium field, portable, online and laboratory analytical instrumentation. Wolfgang will provide you with some valuable insights in this often used technology. pH measurement is an important parameter. pH and the results can, in, can easily be influenced in many ways. With a solid understanding of these fundamentals, your outcomes will undoubtedly be see in an hand enhancement sorry but before we begin i would like to inform you that this session will be recorded and it will be sent to you after the webinar you can also find all of our past and upcoming webinars on our website under the events section we will be answering all the questions at the end of the session so please submit your questions at any time using the question function we would also appreciate your feedback on this webinar. So please, after the uh, webinar, it would be great if you could fill in uh, the survey at the end of the session. But I don't want to take more of your time. So let's begin the training. Wolfgang, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. <clears throat> Thank you all to, to attend on this PH seminar and to, to spend the time with us to, to hear a bit more about PH. So, the pH measure looks quite simple. Just dip into the sensor, tip it into, into the sample and read the value. As you can see on the picture, the pH sensor and the thermometer look not so much different. And pH sensors look a little bit like classic thermometers and similar easy measurement could be expected. And very often this is even barely the case, but there's much more behind which can go right or unfortunately also wrong. pH is really everywhere. It belongs to the most often measured parameters on the planet. Up after probably weight and temperature, or the other way around, temperature and weight, is it probably the third most measured parameter. The age is fundamental to all life on our planet. Plants, human, animals would second if the physiological pH is not within very strict limits. Examples for benefits of measuring pH are as it prevent damage to human, animals, environment materials. Of course, cost reduction in production or streamlining of manufacturing process of product with defined attributes. And last but not least, of course, to satisfy legal and regulatory environment uh, requirements. So, before, before we dive in deeper, let's have a look at a few applications from daily life. Most of our food has a pH in the acid range, and sour food tastes fresh, usually neutral pH food. Is typically more or less tasteless, and most of the alkaline stuff is inedible. The age is important also as a quality attribute during processing meat after slaughtering. <clears throat> Storage life can be influenced with pH, as increase of bacteria is also pH dependent. When we say the milk is getting sour, we, we don't think about pH normally, but it's a function of pH. The fresh milk has a pH of about 6.6 .6 to 6.8. During the lifetime, the pH decreases and the milk coagulates at about pH 4.7. So, a few more examples. Stuff, the raw material for bread, only rises at certain pH with CO2 bubbles for fluffy consistency. Otherwise, it would be unpleasant part. In the environment, in a wastewater treatment plant, <clears throat> the pH is important to let the microorganisms grow and do their job. Rain can get acid from air pollution. But because rain takes CO2 from the atmosphere on its way down, a, below, a, be, sorry, a, be, a pH below to 5.7 is still natural. Cosmetics are called often pH neutral for the skin. This means they are, they are adapted to the slightly acid pH of the skin. pH is also important for plants, for optimal growth, for sunflowers, and for cabbage, even the color is pH dependent. Water uh, sorry. 
Sorry, sorry, Wolfgang, can I just interfere uh, because we get some complaints of the noise. Are you talking right into your uh, microphone because it sounds quite um, yeah, short in your microphone? Can you try it again, please? Maybe a little yeah, bit yeah. more distant, a little bit more distance I, because... I, okay, I had some, some small ventilator far away. Maybe it was the reason <laughs> I switched this off now. Maybe it's better now. Is it? Yeah, now? I that think because I think it's. I think it sounds better. Thank you. Oh, I will okay. come back oh, if it's you. not the case. And <laughs> uh, for sorry the, for for the people. Yeah, thank you. No, no, thank you for the for the hint. Of course, instead of continuing with that. So in water cooling systems, the pH needs to be in a certain level range to avoid either corrosion or precipitations. The newspaper is printed on a cheaper, not acid free paper, and therefore a newspaper looks after a short time already not so nice and gets yellow and looks like breakable, while for import literature would be used acid free paper. So after that, we dive in a little bit deeper in the, in the real pH. Let's have a quick look at the scale. This goes from 0 to 14. And the definition is, uh, as we all probably learned in school, is defined as the negative logarithm of the hydrogen ion activity. So here's a few more examples, which food you can find where. So most of the food is in the access range. And then the alkaline range is more cleaning products and baking products. But what's very important now, when you look behind this pH 0 to 14, this is, um, is, much, is a much wider range than it looks like because it's a logarithm scale, which doesn't go from zero to 14 simply, but it's over 14 decades. And this is more than probably any other instrument in the laboratory can do, even more exp much more expensive. With others, you have even to look after the matrix, you have to dilute it or to prepare it. And here, you just dip in and you expect the value, an exact value over 14 decades from zero to 14. And, <clears throat> This scale also shows that if a reaction, for example, is at pH 5 completely different at pH 6, this is not the difference between 5 and 6, but it's 10 times higher or lower concentration or activity. So this, this explains a little bit such kind of behavior probably. At the pH electrode, what's very important is measures H plus activity. It doesn't measure the whole thing or go to H plus to minus 2 only the hydrogen activity, you will see later what, what this can cause. So what you need to measure pH is very easy. Of course, you need an electrode to measure that. Then you need a cable to connect it to the meter. And you need some samples to measure and buffer solutions to tell the, um, to, to check the electrode. And the, it's, we say we calibrate the electrode, but in practical, in praxis, we tell the meter the, the actual data of the electrode in this case. So now we come to an important point about the electrode, how this in principle works. Let's have a quick look at the technical design of this pH combination electrode to understand a bit what happens. It consists of the measuring class and the so-called reference electrode. So the measuring class is here, the reference electrode is here. We want to measure exactly and only the pH dependent potential, which is created at the class electrode. On the surface of this class electrode is the important swell layer, provided it had been stored long enough in water or electrolyte. <clears throat> Later more about that. The more H plus ions are in the solution, the more positive we'll get the potential at the swell layer. No more. We, we cannot measure simply the single potential. Therefore, we are using the reference electrode as a counterpart. This reference electrode could be just stable, nothing else than stable, to measure only the changing potential at the class electrode. To measure the class electrode potential versus the reference electrode, we need to connect the reference with the sample. The reference chamber is connected via the so-called diaphragm to the sample. This is now we have a closed electric circuit to measure millivolt with a pH meter to calculate from that the pH value. The circuit leads from the meter to the inner buffer through the glass membrane. Yeah. The glass membrane through the sample, through the diaphragm, through the reference, and back to the meter. The 
The pH meter is a special millivolt meter and calculates from the measured millivolt <clears throat> using the calibration data, the pH value. Anything what disturbs this closed circuit will disturb the measurement measured result too. For example, the block diaphragm would disconnect this closed circuit and so to say switch off the measurement. This can usually be caused by difficult samples containing, for example, solids or proteins. Probably most of the lifetime of an electrode ends because of non function and diaphragm or reference. The diaphragm is a very important part of the electrode. We will have a look at different options a bit later. Probably the end of the lifetime comes about 80% from the diaphragm and not from the measuring class electrode. Another example and a challenge is pure water, means low ionic solutions are challenged too, as they don't conduct well the required electric current in the glass membrane and the diaphragm. So there's hundreds of types, about seven, 800 different types. This comes from different diameters, different lengths, different connectors, plug heads, different lengths of cables, temperature sensor, yes or no, and which temperature sensor gets to score it in. So it's very, it's, it's a very, very wide range. <clears throat> but if you look a little bit closer, and it's not so many in general anymore. It's a plastic electrode for robust measurement. It's a glass precision electrode available for precise measurements. Electrodes with a thread to screw them into a process and measure continuously. Micro electrodes for small volumes. Flat membrane electrodes, uh, electrodes to measure on surfaces or stick in electrodes to do stick in measurements. And there are accessories like this puncture measurement for samples. Like, like this knife here, where you can insert the electrode to measure in meat or cheese or fish as a, as a stick-in measurement. And instead of cutting with the knife, measuring pH and then the temperature, this is done all in one. Just stick it in and it measures pH with the temperature. So here, now we come to the matrix and to the conditions. So what can what is important? Uh, to consider when you want to have a good measurement, the pH range where you want to measure, the content of the soft salts, extreme high or extreme low, the electrode poisons, precipitations or suspensions, and the viscosity maybe of the sample, or are there fluids and what's the pH? And then the measuring conditions, like the temperature and the pressure. Here you see a scheme of the electrode. This is a real one, and this is a scheme. And you see it contains a lot of functioning function parts. Looks just like a stick, but inside is a lot of uh, different things to, to get a good measurement. Sorry. So next we come to the pH range for extreme pH values. The literature describes the so-called acid error and the so-called alkali error. While the acid error is observed rarely, this alkali error occurs in a very alkaline range and cause from pH readings. In this situation, at around pH 13 or 14, high concentrations of sodium ions may pretend an increase in hydrogen ion activity, and this can result in showing a lower pH value as it is. This alkali error can be reduced, avoided with a different electrode with suitable pH plus type. Later, we will see more about that. So, but very high concentration of salt ions in the solution will cause a decrease of the activity coefficient. With the lower activity coefficient, also H plus activity would decrease, and this would mean that the pH would increase. Diffusion potentials can appear at the diaphragm, they would influence the shown pH value. And they arise with a different kind and concentration of ions inside the reference and outside the sample. Sorry, this is not moving forward. So this was about this slide. Sorry, it was not moving with my click. Okay, now we come to the electrode poisons. So-called electrode poisons can damage the reference system if they can get inside through the diaphragm. They reach with the electrolyte or with the silver-silver chloride reference system inside. <clears throat> they react with that. This would cause a wrong measurement, a 
least afterwards, or even the damage of the reference system if this reacts with the reference. So we need to avoid that any solution from outside gets into the reference chamber. Therefore, this electrode filling level inside must always be higher than the sample outside to make sure to have a flow out and not a flow into the electrode. This is about precipitation suspensions. Precipitations in the sample can coat the glass membrane and block the diaphragm. This would at least cause an increase of the response time. Blocking of the diaphragm could be reduced or even avoided by choosing a suitable diaphragm type. We will see later more about that. We have a higher sustainable flow. And also suspensions can block the diaphragm. Again, using an electrode with different diaphragm would help to improve. Or abrasive substances like sand would damage the membrane class by grinding if there's a high flow or a high steering rate. So this is about the sample consistency. <clears throat> if, the, if the viscosity is higher, then this could hinder the ion, ionic transport. And depending on the viscosity, you have to choose maybe another electrode type. If it's semi-solid, maybe we need a stick-in or a surface measurement. And if it's solid, we need a sample preparation like an LOA and measure in the aqueous phase. So here you see a very precise laboratory electrode available, which is almost looking like a stick-in electrode a little bit with this design. And this is a real stick-in electrode. So in case of like uh, cream or like soft cheese, as long as it's possible, we always recommend to use this type because this type can be refilled, can be cleaned, can be maintained. It costs also less than, uh, than a stick-in electrode, which lasts probably shorter and doesn't give a better measurement. It's more, just more robust to measure in strong material like hard cheese or, or meat or so. Okay, another point is fluorides in the sample. They can corrode the glass membrane, but only if the pH value is low. So if it's there as a fluoric acid, this would prevent the swell, uh, forming of the swell layer, which is very important and would yield to unstable measuring values. The lifetime of an electrode, of course, will be shortened as this hydrofluoric acid is somehow dissolving the electrode. And uh, a solution could be electrodes with PVDF shaft. But in this case, normally the glass membrane is still there, only the shaft is away. Or it's good, it could be used an antimony type, um, which is also pH sensitive, but there are several disadvantages. Another zero point, and it's a heavy metal which you normally don't want to use, and especially, of course, not possible to food stuff. <clears throat> so now to, we come to a very important part, to the temperature influence. It is very important to measure the temperature and also to report this temperature together with the pH value. The pH value is only a pH value if you say, for example, pH 6.59 at 17 degrees. Also, if it's uh, compensated, what you see here, but that's only the nerves um, reaction what we compensate. There are different effects on temperature of temperature on pH. This is a significant temperature influence on the slope of the sensor, as you can see on this sheet. The new electrode shows perfectly a slope of 59.2 millivolt per pH at 25 degrees. At 50 degrees, it would be 64.1 at 100%, for example, pH, uh, millivolt per pH. Modern pH meters have not only stored the individual slope, but also this temperature behavior, which is according to the Nernst equation. So if the temperature is set in the meter there manually or better measured and documented directly with the pH, this potential failure is eliminated and no need to think about this effect any further. But there's also an individual sample pH behavior. And this, the situation here is completely different. This other influence of temperature comes from the individual sample. And the temperature behavior of standard buffer solutions is usually stored in the meter and corrected automatically. This is completely different for our samples with a mixture of a lot of ions and unknown temperature dependency of the H plus ion activity in such solutions. A few examples what we can see <clears throat> in pure water and pure acid or base. Pure water has pH 7 at 25 degrees, and it's defined like this. 
But if we heat this water, dissociation uh, uh, rises and will increase to, to H plus and OH minus. So we will have more H, OH plus in the sample as active. So the pH sensor measures only the H plus ions, as we said before. So the pH seems to decrease. Also, water is still neutral, of course. If we would do the same with 0 0.001 mole hydrochloric acid, which means 10,000 times higher H plus activity, we would not see a tiny, this tiny part of the additional dissociation of water to H plus and OH minus at all. So as you can see, the pH is stable at the different temperatures, only three. In 0 0.001 mole, so, uh, sodium hydroxide, it is the opposite, it's completely different. At 50 degrees, this H plus activity is divided by 10,000 times lower, and the additional dissociation of water to H plus and OH minus in this case here has a massive impact. Now almost one pH unit, as you can see here. It's getting hot out there. We will see later what this can mean. And um, so, so similar behavior will happen with individual samples, more or less, so with your samples, but we cannot, uh, we cannot quantify it and therefore not compensate it because it's a mix of different salts and it's not like here a, a pure acid or a pure base where we can calculate what, what might happen. One practical example from an industrial production site, mm. an alkaline product sample is measured directly at the process, at, for example, at 70 degrees and later again, the person is going to the lab and cool the, the, so the sample is uh, cooling down. And the values are different and there's no right or wrong normally. It's just the individual temperature behavior. To make these values at different temperatures comparable, they could measure, for example, the product at different temperatures and create a diagram accordingly. In such industrial applications, reproducibility is often more important than accuracy. So this is about process pressure. In case an electrode is put into a process, so we have to choose carefully the type. Is a low maintenance easy to install or liquid electrolyte? This is much more efforts normally. Where to install it into in the process? Not directly near to a pump, for example, because the pressure is changing probably all the time and is decreasing the lifetime probably quite much. And it's about safety, maybe an ARTEX certificate is required. So what can, what can we do with the sensor design? It's about precision and robustness of glass shaft or plastic shaft. What can we do about the L class electrode? We can change this shape or we can change the design of the membrane class. And the reference mm, electrode, we could have different kind of diagrams or different kind of electrolytes. Normally a stream of calcium chloride inside. And it's about handling and storage shaped lifetime. So this is a comparison between the main two main types. So the class shaft is the precise measurement, is the lab use on the left side. The electrolyte is refillable, it's usually three more potassium chloride. It is important to make to, to open this hole during measurement, but there's an hydrostatic pressure, but the electrolyte inside is going out and not starting in. This is uh, and the electrolyte flow out. The level, the level is very important, but the level inside is higher and the sample outside, so that the electrolyte is flowing out and nothing is flowing back. There's an immersion depth, a minimum, which is like here, is the diaphragm, so it must be immersed up to here. And of course, not immersing these whole, or to, not to allow that the sample is flowing in here. And it has to be stored in three mole potassium chloride. <clears throat> the plastic electrode type, is a robust electrode, but it used to go to rivers, for example, measure the environment outside in the water. And there's, this is filled with a gel electrolyte. This is a little bit like this viscous thing, which we take to, to do wallpapers on the wall. And this is potassium chloride saturated. So this is a fully saturated with potassium chloride. And if this is dissolved, it's the end of the lifetime. It's not like here where you fill all the time electrolyte. But this is not refillable, there's no flow out, there's only a connection, and there's a, a minimum immersion, like with the other one, but in principle, it's not a problem to immerse also the head if there's no strong headaches. And here is very important to store it in three more potassium chloride, 
because otherwise inside is a very concentrated potassium chloride solution. If, if you would store that with uh, distilled water with the not, this would be a big osmotic pressure and it would be the fastest way to dissolve this salt stock inside and to have the shortest possible lifetime probably uh, more than in uh, during working and measuring. So this is now about the membrane shape. That's quite logical. So this is the classical sphere from a glass blower in, in history. So still done very often. It has big surface. This is an advantage. Also, and uh, now we're more modern is things like that easier to clean. Still a normal, a normal measurement. And maybe for soft cheese or soft uh, soft cream is also good to immerse it there. Microelectrodes or low volumes of flat membranes to measure on the wet, of course, a wet surface like a fruit or <clears throat> on that skin. And this is a sticky electrode. So as we said, we have different membrane classes. Electrodes produced with different type of these membrane classes for best results, also in challenging applications. Probably most of us don't think too much about that as most applications run well with the one type we have. This standard class type, we call it class, class type A, is marked yellow works well and fast in most samples like the drinking water, service water, sewage, general applications, hydration. But this universal class is not so suitable for precise measurement in a very alkaline range, around 13 or 14. For this application, electrodes with other membrane class should be used, here called class type H, also yellow mark. So these are the two main parts. Um, this class type H is very good and precise in the high alkaline range. But as such a class type, as a higher resistance, it would be not the first choice for low ionic or low temperature applications, as the resistance at low temperatures um, would, would get much higher. And also for titration, for example, where you want to have a fast result, this would be not a perfect choice in standard applications. As you can see, there are a few more membrane class types, like a S class, which is often used on sterilizable electrodes for bioreactors or fermenters. Okay, now we come to the second, to the next part, to, to the diet pump, which is a very, very important function and element of the electrode. So we look at the first thing. Is that this, this diet pump is the connection between the reference and the sample. And if it would be blocked, what we had before, by any particles or proteins, the electrode would not measure the edge at all. In the worst case, it would be, it would be like switch off the measurement. Most common diaphragms for refillable lab electrodes are ceramic, platinum, and culture. Ceramic is with its such cracked cavities, tends to pollution or blockage caused by deposits or chemical reactions. Therefore, it's mainly used for clear, easy aqueous solutions. Especially in difficult samples, platinum and culture will work much more reliable and longer. With a higher flow out rate and the, um, the smoother design, they tend much less to pollution or blockage. The platinum diaphragm consists of several tiny platinum wires twisted together. In most of the cases, this platinum diaphragm is the best choice as it's easier to handle, less fragile, and less expensive than the ground joint diaphragm. Here you can see this more, more clear what is happening. So comparison between the most, most common used uh, diaphragms, ceramic and platinum. You can see on the diaphragm on the left, on, on the diagram, sorry, on the diaphragm on the left, that the blue curve of platinum version is faster and more stable. There's no influence on pH when the steerer is switched on, and also no noise during steering. So it, it answers the question with, with a good diaphragm, how long to steer, how long to wait after steering when you measure. So the, the, value, the value is stable, and that's it with a good electrode and a good diaphragm in most applications. The electrolyte is flowing out <clears> through the channels between these tiny platinum wires with a high speed in micro dimensions, keeping itself clean with this flow and building a good connection to the sample and also between reference and glass membrane. So this is the reason why it shows often not only here much better results than the ceramic version and, and that even at similar cost because it sounds expensive but it's about one milligram platinum which is not a real cost factor of course. So especially in challenging applications good diaphragms make the real difference. So this is, makes really sense to look at that if you are not 
happy with the lifetime or with the, with the measurement, with the, with the performance. So this we are sometimes asked when you use this electrode, when the reference electrolyte is flowing into the sample. And um, as we know, the reference could be just stable and constant all the time. This curve shows that in case of concentration change of this three mole potassium chloride, also the potential will change and therefore a different pH will be measured. So for example, if the concentration changed after the calibration from three mole potassium chloride and uh, to one mole potassium chloride, the potential would shift almost 30 millivolts. This is a half pH, uh, half pH unit. So this is a big, uh, this is a big difference. All measurements would, would, uh, with this half pH unit shifted and wrong afterwards. So therefore, it's very important to keep the concentration the same, at least after the calibration is done. That's most important. And if there's any doubt about the potassium chloride concentration, a new calibration should be performed. The concentration can change, for example, by dissolving potassium chloride crystals inside or by filling by mistake with water instead of three mole potassium chloride or using the wrong potassium chloride concentration or the sample put into the reference chamber. So this is really a big reason for a certain failure. So here we check uh, if you immerse the electrode into the sample and maybe you want to measure productivity afterwards or you think about how much uh, potassium chloride is flowing into the sample. Here you can see a little bit what is the effect. So while measuring pH, typically a bit of the electrode out solution is flowing very slowly from the reference into the sample. So normally this does not affect the sample much. But depending how low is the volume or the measurement takes too long, or how big is the beaker or how small, eventually it might make a difference to special samples. In this case, this example shows that after a half minute, the after a half minute, the conductivity would change by about six microsiemens per centimeter. So this is about immersion depths and low volumes. How so deep should an electrode immersed into the sample? And the answer is only so deep that the side of the pH plus also the diaphragm is immersed. It's here again. Yeah. More makes no sense. It's just would mean more to clean. It's very important that always the level of the electrolyte, what we said before, inside is higher than the sample level outside. So make sure that there's a flow out, that, that there's a hydrostatic pressure. Otherwise, the sample could flow into the reference instead, and of, instead of electrolyte flowing out from there. So, for very small samples, so for very small samples, about the, the, the measurement could be done like you, you see here, holding the sensor in an angle. Diaphragm must look down and divide it to the sample. Glass membrane should also work in this case, if not fully covered. Or microelectrodes can be used to measure in pivots. Always the diaphragm need to be in those two, of course. In this case, it would be even better to have a little bit of thicker one because this would get with less sample or the volume up. So how to store the electrode? Combination electrode and reference electrodes are stored in reference electrolyte. Usually three mole potassium chloride, they are stored Rest at room temperature, normally don't store them dry as they would age faster with every time you store them dry and have to water them again. In case the glass membrane had been stored dry, it would need to be watered at least overnight to reform the spell layer. So you cannot measure immediately, so you have to wait and the electrodes aging faster. So even if you don't use it for a while, you always recommend to store it still in electrolyte normally. So even with suitable storing and handling, so the, the, the lifetime of a pH sensor still can vary in a wide range from days up to some years or several years. High temperatures or aggressive media against the glass membrane, like hydrofluoric acid, can influence the lifetime a lot. A helpful accessory to measure this with similar robustness of a plastic shaft electrode, but the quality features of a glass shaft and a glass electrode might provide the black armoring you can see on the left side of this piece. 
can be easily attached and screwed without any additional tools or standard uh, shaft plus electrodes, and it, uh, it will reduce the risk of a plus package, like here, 100 millimeter length and 12 millimeter diameter. This scheme gives you just a very rough idea about the life expectations. In general, the more the applications are away from pH 7 and or from 20 degrees, the faster electrodes age. The most limiting factor still might be the individual media or application, and of course, very much is it also depending on you and depending on the individual care. So just a brief comments about cleaning of PX sensors. We cannot do it from through to everything. So for the outside of the sensor with flash shaft and platinum diaphragm, probably similar as it's in solvents would fit, with which you also clean your beaker. But of course, please no dishwasher, no ultrasonic, no microwave, or such kind of things. So again, short about this. This is now a little bit more challenging because inside is all the functioning elements. The cleaning inside, if necessary, must be done very careful and only using water or electrolyte normally. Detailed information you can find also in the flyer what we have on the website of, about maintenance of pH electrodes, which explains detailed uh, how to treat such kind of electrodes inside and outside. So this, as we <clears throat> said a little bit before, zero point and the slope of pH sensors change over the time, over the lifetime, and therefore a regular adjustment is required. What is commonly called calibration is in reality an adjustment of the pH meter to the actual slope and zero point of the used electrode. Most common is a two-point calibration with two buffers to get a curve. For example, for pH 4 and 7, also multi-point calibration is possible. In any case, it's very important to use only fresh buffers and only ones, of course. The frequency of calibration depends on kind of samples and individual demands. The standard could be weekly, but we, have, we know also people who calibrate even twice a day. If it's very important and they have many samples. The calibration should be done properly because this is not, never forget, it's impossible to measure more accurate than the calibration was performed. So these diagrams shows the zero point. The best case in the zero millivolt for pH 7 with a new electrode. And the slope, in best case, is minus 59.2 millivolt for pH at 25 degrees both. So there are different buffer solution types and for calibration of electrodes. These different buffers are available. They are the norm buffer solutions, which is defined precise and same behavior independent where they bind independent from any manufacturer. There are technical buffers. They can have varying precise and also a different temperature behavior. So the user needs to check which buffers will fit to this equipment. You will see a little bit later why. And there are normed buffers and suitable technical buffers are automatically recognized from the meter nowadays. And also the temperature behavior of these buffers is programmed into the most of the meters and does not need to be corrected. For other or individual buffer solutions, the individual temperature curve must be known for correction, and the meter will be set manually to the normal pH value for the actual temperature. The most common is a two-point calibration. In simple case, also a one-point is possible. Using for the slope the theoretical value, that's not perfect, of course, but easy to do. Also, three or more calibration points are possible, but normally electrodes measure quite linear over a wide range, so this is not often required. So, this is about temperature compensation. The temperature effect on buffers can be compensated in different ways. Most common is automatic compensation. Using modern meters where the temperature behavior for the used buffers is stored and considered, in this case, nothing further to be done. Also, a manual compensation is possible. In this case, also the actual buffer temperature must be measured or, or must be known. The correct temperature, the correct pH at a particular temperature has to be checked on lookup tables, either on the pH buffer label or on the buffer shade, which should come with it. Then the correct value will be set manually in the pH meter. 
the option with most efforts would be under control temperature conditions like a water bath, usually all temp uh, thermostated at 25 degrees centigrade. In this case, nothing would have to be compensated, but this is obviously very rarely and a lot of efforts for this pH measurement. So this is this shows very interesting about technical buffers, what can happen. If a technical buffer type is used, which is not selected correctly in the meter setup. Yeah, you select the buffer 10, but you select buffer 2, but you use buffer type 3, you see here. Of course, at 25 degrees, buffer 4 is 4, 7 is 7, 10 is 10. Yeah? But especially with the buffer 10, this needs to be considered. And uh, the different technical buffers, pH 10, can, can show quite varying results at different temperatures. In this example, the buffer 10 type 2 is set to the meter, but the buffer type 3 is used to so take, for example, out of the bridge at 10 degrees. And the buffer 3 is close enough to be identified by the meter automatically as the buffer 10, but as the other buffer 10. And so the deviation of the 0 0.21 pH coming purely from the buffer is calculated wrongly into the electrons flow. So, so all measurements afterwards would have a deviation based on this wrong calibration. And uh, what is very important that the meter is measuring a millivolt value and would not allocate if the deviation comes from the electrode or from the buffer. For the meter, it's clear that the buffer is always as fresh and 100% considered as we want to check the electrode. And if the buffer is wrong, then this is uh, this will cause a wrong calibration or adjustment. So here, a little bit of summary or a little bit what sensors generally it is like. It's a, if the refilling opening is closed during the measurement, because then there's no flow out, but maybe flow in of samples. So it's a, it's a worse measurement, no retrostatic pressure. <clears throat> so probably the lifetime is shorter. The dry storage or storing the dry storage will cause a shorter lifetime, and you have to wait for the next measurement because you have this water it again before you can measure. Storing in distinct water will faster low maintenance electrode because the salt inside the electrode can be sold in the fastest in the, salt in the fastest possible way. Using as a sphere, as long as you don't touch the beaker, it's everything is fine. But if you touch and scratch the beaker, maybe one scratch is enough to give a short circuit and to destroy the electrode. So this has to be done carefully. Repeated use of buffer, of course, because you know, this this is a risk of, of the measurement of afterwards if the buffer is not good anymore. Mechanical cleaning and rubbing of the glass membrane. If this is done uh, very fast, very rough, then this can cause some hydrostatic things, and the pH value would not be stable for the next seconds or minutes. And of course, you can have a scratch if you're not careful. Precipitations on glass membrane or diaphragm will, will make the measurement worse, or a polluted reference system could give different results or respond the electric. So this looks quite crazy, but there's a checklist about uh, when we look for an electrode, but we need to know is it what's the main point? Accuracy, glass available or plastic or robust electrode? Do we need a temperature sensor separate or integrated? Of course, you need to know the design and the time of cable to connect it to the meter. <laughs> there at least. So if you if you tell us or we you to but you want to measure from pH 7 to, sorry, from pH 0 to pH 14 in, in the best possible accuracy, then of course you need at least two electrodes, as we said before, for the alkaline range. For high accuracy, you need another one. And uh, depending on the temperature range, you can look at the specifications. And this is getting, when you go down a little bit less important, but it's good to know. And if you are, if you would be not happy with your electrode, then you would like to have a better one for your application. It's normally better that we describe the application and we look for the best one and not tell us what you use now only because then we try to find a similar one, of course, which may be the same, not perfect. This is an example of food preparation, what we had before several years, but it's not the newest one, but this was a case where we have the experience from beginning to the end what happened. So the food preparation, which is comes in the mix with the yogurt or is below the yogurt, will be mixed by yourself when you open it. The conductivity of this food preparation is normally very low. So in this case, it was seven microsiemens, like almost nothing here. So it's very difficult to measure in general. Then the viscosity is high, of course, of this preparation. And then your food fibers, 
from the fruits. And in this yogurt, there's normally also vanilla or coconut oil, which can cover the glass membrane and makes the measurement slowly. So here we, we checked in this real case, we checked the speed of the glass electrode and we were lucky that uh, we found one of the four were very fast. So we had chosen this glass, this glass type and we changed from a ceramic diaphragm. This is the light plan. And we changed from a ceramic diaphragm all over this year. This was from the quality department. We changed to a platinum diaphragm, which is not blocked by, by food fibers and which can handle better this low conductivity. So they had afterwards without paying here, they have a much better measurement and they have a much longer life. Plan. This is just a word about PNP. So with analog electrodes, which are still the most used electrodes, if you change from one electrode to the other, if you use, for example, stick in surface and normal electrodes every day, every time you change, you have to calibrate because you have to tell the meter the actual data from the electrode. And um, so and if you want to do that more GNP, then there are digital electrodes, which can be connected by cable or even wireless with Bluetooth. And these digital electrodes would tell to the meter their individual calibration data, serial number, and then to calibrate again. So if the if the late shift would change the electrode and forget to calibrate from the next day, from this time, everything would be probably wrong with the wrong old calibration data. This cannot happen with this electrode. This electrode you can, because the data, electronic data, the, the calibration data is in the head, you can change from a lab meter, you can dip this to, to, to a sales back to the outside that you can measure in the field. And uh, with, the, with the already done calibration because everything is stored in the meter, in the electrode. It was much more GMP than before. Sometimes there's a question about non-aqueous media, so media, so pH is defined for water and not for any kind of solvents. But you can measure millivolt values in solvents, like this is used, for example, for titration, where you want to have a millivolt jump, but the, not the exact pH value. And so this means there's no calibration, makes no sense, and it's not needed, and it's also not possible, because there's no, no water pH buffer this bit, because it's not a pH scale anymore. Another application sample is soil, <clears throat> but the applications you can see it because of minerals and so you have to keep their pH plus different reasons in a certain pH range. And uh, here you can see how to do that. For example, the soil, there are different ways, like if they are direct stick in measurement. But this is, of course, a risk when you stick it in. Is there enough humidity to measure in the sample? How is the consistency? If there's a very grinding, if it's a very Rough sand, or if there are stones, it can be scratched or baked. So, in this case, if you have to do that, probably is the best to change the least expensive electrode because it will probably not last for long. Another option, much better option, if you can do that, is to do an LOR, which will dissolve all pH influence ingredients normally and to measure this in the aqueous phase. There are several instructions how to do an LOR. Normally, it's 24 hours, but it can be different. It's also a different. It's where you add potassium, uh, sorry, calcium chloride. And uh, these are the reasons for this to have these new nutrients. So that last but not least, uh, there's a very strange application, one of the most strange applications where pH is measured in the stomach of a cow. Uh, and this is very actual because of CO2, depending what the cow is, uh, cow is eating, what uh, what is the pH in the stomach, and what will come out. And, uh, so this is a very common procedure. And luckily, the cow looks quite uninterested. But there's many, many more applications like healing of wounds. Is 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 it a function of pH? This some people search for that. Lab safety. What about pH in the eye? If you work there, how deep it get into it? It gets into the eye and how get it out with neutralization. For a recent uh, application was pH uh, in sludge because we take wastewater treatment plant sludge contained COVID and uh, they understood that if they set the pH above 12, there's the COVID is killed. It was not in, in there anymore. So it was in some countries a rule that they had to set the pH above 12 to avoid that. So that's maybe the presentation. There's a lot of information on the website. There's also a pH handbook, what you can get from us on the website. 
And so of course you can send emails and ask for more questions to PWR or to us. So that was my presentation, John. Any further questions? Yes, there are there are some questions. Uh, first of all, Wolfgang, I want to apologize, but the sound was not really that bad, uh, that good. So maybe we can try to do, do it um, in a Teams and then send the people a correct uh, recording of this. Uh, this is something that we will look into. But we do have some questions too. Um, there is one uh, general one uh, on slide. 31, you have spoken about a pH correction. Is this depending on the temperature of the sample? Is this done in comparison to a bu buffer? So I think maybe that slide can be again explained. Uh, this temperature dependence of the sample, I think that that is the issue. And it was, I think, in slide 31 or 30, let me see. 31, no, 30 then, yeah. Yeah, yeah. this one, yeah. It was this one, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, so what was the question, but uh, just general, yeah, or? Yeah, so the, the question was, uh, the person, uh, Marta, she didn't fully understand this slide. Do you mean that the pH correction, depending on the temperature of the sample, is done in comparison with a buffer? but it can not exactly match the pH change that temperature gives to the specific sample. Yes, that's correct, yeah. So this this means, yeah, it's, it's, it says something about the accuracy, so the reproducibility is good, but the accuracy can vary, of course, because all these ions, these individual ions in the sample influence can influence the activity of the hydrogen activity and uh, with a with a clear, with one clear chemical solution like a, like an acid or a base, you can calculate that. Or for the buffers, it is stored in the meter. We have practical experience for which buffer has which pH and what is the temperature behavior. These curves are stored in the meter. But of course, there are unlimited numbers of individual or natural samples, any kind of mix of salts. So it's practically like impossible to, to compensate that in the correct way. Uh, and what, so what she said is right, yeah. Yeah, okay. I hope this uh, answers your question, Marta. Uh, then we also have some questions concerning the applications. Uh, for example, which electrode, electrode you suggest for measuring some uh, separate uh, ions? Like, for example, perchlorate was one. Which electrode you would suggest? Are these questions you want to answer now or should we take them also um, after the session, because there are some more questions, for example, also for aluminium uh, oxide, uh, we have also, so these are quite specific questions. Maybe I should first start with a general probably, question. Yeah, yeah, it's probably yeah. better. And, and we will answer, that. yeah, and we will answer these uh, specific questions then uh, via mail, if that's okay. So here is one general more. How to store the electrodes best between measure measurements with three molar KCL, they get an increasing alkali error and an increasing response time. Which storage solutions can be used to avoid these effects? This is kind of new for me, I have to say. This was a combination of everything, so I don't yeah. Under yeah. understood it right. So to store the electrode is normally the best to store it in this solution, which is also in the reference electrode. And so normally it's three mole potassium chloride. If you prefer yeah. it, the three mole potassium chloride is the best to store it also in this solution. And for, yeah. for low maintenance electrodes, which is saturated potassium chloride, you can say the more the better, yeah, but also normally in three mole potassium chloride. And the okay. other, the, the, this was a combined question that there was more about alkaline error. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because they got an increasing response time and an increasing alkali error when they stored in KCL3 molar. But I, for, for, for me, I have never heard about that one, oh, I have to oh, say. But okay. maybe we can take this also separate so, behind yeah. the scene. Yeah. Especially, yeah. yeah. Uh, on slide 63, 
the I axis was missing. Um, yeah, 63, 63, one, two back, yeah. The I X and, and the re, the question was, yeah, what is the average lifetime of an electrode with a ceramic diaphragm fragment in your chart on slide 63, the I axis was missing. Uh, but that was not, I think that was not the, the goal of the explanation, I guess. No, no, it was just say that it's, um, I, I would, this, this came like that, yeah, because it's a, it's an individual guard, but it's months and years, you can say, yeah. <clears throat> this was a few months and later it lasted one, two years. Yeah. Yeah, but it's mainly, I think, the, the conclusion is that you say, more than half of the electrodes. This company was using 100 electrodes per year. So then you can say they save more than 50 electrodes per year. Yeah, so in, the red, in this red part, 95, 98, they needed 100 electrodes per year because it was a big company making food preparations and they measured only color and pH as a quality attribute. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just looking to the more general, ah, the more general questions. Electrons, yes, very useful. I see also some, it's again, some very specific questions. Can I ask him, because we have still two minutes left, uh, what electrode should be used for measuring saliva? Do you know this saliva? I must admit, no, no, I don't know that. No. Okay. Uh, anyway, we are reaching the end of uh, the time. We have your questions, all your questions here, and you can still send them in uh, two minutes still. Um, we will answer them. Uh, there are quite many with very specific questions, but we will answer them in a mail afterwards, or we will contact you in the next few days, if that's okay for you, uh, for the participants. And uh, then I... It leaves me only to thank you, Wolfgang, for the information you gave and for the participants. And sorry for the noise again, because the sound was not very, very good. But as said, we will try to find a solution for that, for the recording, which we will send you after this, uh, after this uh, webinar. So thank you very much. And I wish you all a very nice uh, afternoon. Thank you. Also thank you. Thank you. I will leave it one more minute open for some remaining questions. And if you want to answer to the survey, please do so, so we can improve our sessions for next time. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you.